Welcome to Libraries Today. This program is intended to recognize and highlight the unexpected ways local libraries serve their communities today. I'm your host, Stan Howe. The primary purpose of a public library is to promote reading. One of the key ways to do that is through reading programs, and public libraries provide a wide variety, summer reading, story times for children, book clubs, and more. For kids and students, reading programs are particularly important. Reading develops language skills, improves classroom performance, encourages creativity, fosters a love of books, and of course, teaches reading skills. So reading for youngsters has a lot of benefits, and libraries and their educational partners deliver these benefits to children and their parents. A program here in West Virginia that works hand-in-hand -hand with libraries and schools to encourage reading in children who might not otherwise be exposed to books is Read Aloud West Virginia. Read Aloud works to motivate children to read by placing volunteer readers in schools and providing access to books and other reading materials. When we return, I'll talk to the executive director of Read Aloud West Virginia, Mary Kay Bond. We'll be right back after this. Up, college is hard, down, those books are heavy. My sport is football, but my passion is education. Right up here. So every year I take promising high schoolers on a college tour there, dark to show them that higher education means a brighter future. <laughs> my name is Namdi Asamoa. I don't just wear the shirt, I live it. Find out how you can live United for Education. Give, advocate, volunteer. Go to liveunited.org. Do you wear this? Read Aloud West Virginia was established in 1986 in Kanawha County. It has seen some ups and downs over the years, but is now a freestanding nonprofit organization whose goal it is motivate kids to want to read. With me now to talk about the program, Executive Director Mary Kay Bond. Mary Kay, thanks for being with us. Thank you for inviting me. So tell me about the organization. Um, as you pointed out, we're a freestanding nonprofit. We're a 501c3. Um, we were established basically in my living room back in 1986. A group of mothers had read the Read Aloud Handbook by Jim Trelease and were alarmed that a lot of kids were becoming only classroom readers. They were not reading beyond the classroom and they were not becoming proficient at reading. So we officially incorporated in January of 87. Uh, we called ourselves Read Aloud West Virginia, but we were pretty much confined to Kanawha County. Other counties heard about us, uh, contacted us, and we grew to um, multiple counties. Mm -hmm. And at that point, we were contacted by what is now called the West Virginia, uh, the Education Alliance, it was then the West Virginia Education Fund. And they were interested in adopting our program which at that point we were running it out of our kitchens and our vans. <laughs> we were all young moms, and that was very attractive. And um, so we became part of um, the West Virginia Education Fund um, in 93. Um, and uh, someone was hired to take the program statewide. And when she left, they approached me. I worked there from 95 to 2000. Um, I had to leave because of an illness in the family, but when I left, we were in approximately 53 of the state's 55 counties. Over the course of the next seven years, their focus changed away more toward research and advocacy and um, the, the centralized support for these individual chapters um, was somewhat diminished. And so uh, in 2007, we were down to four counties. We, mm. Our volunteers are wonderful, but they're interested in doing the actual reading and, and that sort of thing, not, you know, organizing. organizing. Yeah. And um, well, I mean, they're, they're involved in that now, but they needed, they needed uh, some structural support. And so um, to make a long story short, we decided to reboot. And um, in 2008, we got some funding from the Benedum Foundation. And that's what we've been in the process of doing. We're currently standing at uh, approximately 30 county chapters. Where I say approximately because we have some, chap uh, some counties that have indicated they want to join us this school year, and we'll be announcing that soon. Um, and we are still very volunteer dependent. We have a centralized office that does the newsletters that supports those chapters in terms of developing materials, 
training readers, um, uh, planning new initiatives, and but we, we really count on our volunteers. Mm -hmm. Last year we had over a thousand readers throughout the state going on a regular basis to read primarily in classrooms, although we have a few exceptions. Um, and they are weekly commercials for reading. Um, they, these volunteers also assist us with these book distributions that we do within chapters, and we do that based upon our funding and the capacity of the local chapter. Where does your funding come from now? Um, we receive funding from a variety of sources. Um, we have foundations, like, as the Benedim Foundation, which I mentioned, but also a number of corporate donors who have been generous in, they understand the importance of uh, raising a generation of readers, many generations of readers, <laughs> to the employment scene. And they have been very supportive. We also depend on individual donors. Our annual fund is supported by a large number of people throughout the state and actually even out of state. <laughs> um, we also write grants and um, for specific projects. So um, we're very dependent on the kindness of strangers and friends. <laughs> So let's talk about the programs that you offer. What uh, uh, Describe for me how you go about what you do. Um, we have basically a four-pronged approach. Um, our goal is to um, kind of change the literacy climate in this state. Um, and what I mean by that, and Jim Trulise, who wrote the book I mentioned earlier, talks about um, it's a little hard to learn to snow ski if you don't if you live in the tropics. <laughs> and if you live in, a, in an, uh, an area where you may not have a lot of bookstores, uh, a lot of access to books, you may not place the value on reading that we need children to place on that. Um, we know that motivation is the key to acquiring any, uh, any skill, whether that's football or basketball or um, stamp collecting, whatever. And if you're not motivated, if you don't value that particular skill, you won't do the hard work to achieve that skill. And so we work very closely with school systems, with libraries, to help children um, live in a climate that supports reading, that shows children that we value reading, um, to help them see that it's relevant, and also, and this is key, that it's enjoyable. We don't gravitate to things that are not fun. And too often, children equate reading with workbook pages or um, testing or dividing words into syllables. They don't equate it with the story. If, if they haven't been introduced to it, perhaps in the home, or if because of intensive testing in the classroom, reading aloud for pleasure has been pushed out, they don't have that sense of pleasure that is a, an important motivating force. You mentioned book distribution. Mm -hmm. How does that work? Well, as I said earlier, um, a lot of children live in counties where there may not be bookstores or, unfortunately, many of our schools do not have libraries. So um, you can't learn to ride a horse if you don't have a horse. <laughs> So we work to put books, we say we put books in the hands and on the minds of West Virginia's children. Um, year before last, thanks to a very generous donator, donation from a publisher, we were able to put over 19,000 books in the hands of children. Wow. Uh, last year we did not have that same donation, but we were still able, thanks to our donations from corporations and individuals and, and, and through grants, we were able to purchase and distribute brand new books, over 8,000 books. Um, and it's something that we're wedded to. Um, uh, we work with preschoolers through, um, primarily through, from preschoolers through grade six, although we do have some programs in middle schools in some counties. And we've actually worked with high schoolers, um, training them to become readers to younger children. and. Um, that is particularly beneficial uh, from two angles. One is that the younger children think the high school students are rock stars. And secondly, those high school students are the next generation of parents. So we're trying to get the message across that your child's reading education does not begin when they enter school. Your child's reading education begins the day you bring them home from the hospital. Mm -hmm. 
the words you say, sing, and read to a child make up the word toolbox that your child is going to use when he or she walks into a classroom. And that toolbox is critical. You talked about uh, the importance of volunteers to what you do. Mm -hmm. uh, where do the volunteers come from? Um, we publicize our orientations um, through media, um, both traditional media and social media. Um, I've visited a lot of Lions Clubs and Rotary Clubs and Women's Clubs around the state, and our volunteers are absolutely wonderful. Each county chapter has a board, an individual of dedicated volunteers who are kind of the unsung heroes. They reach out into their communities. They know the people to contact and, and the ways to reach um, readers. Obviously, we love to get parent volunteers, grandparent volunteers. Uh, we find that a number of retired teachers who are interested in continuing to work in the schools, but just not on a day-to-day -day basis, make wonderful readers. We have attorneys. We have um, um, business people. Um, they come from all walks of life. Um, our goal is to have someone who will send that message that reading is enjoyable, relevant, and valued in West Virginia. Is there training involved? Yes. We do ask that each of our readers attend a one-time uh, orientation, and the dates for those orientations around the state are posted on our website calendar. Uh, we also try to advertise them locally. We send out flyers, whatever. And um, we feel that that's an important part of making sure that this is a high-quality program. Um, those orientations are not to teach people to read. They're to let them know the parameters of the program, uh, what we're doing, the importance of uh, preparing what they take into the classroom, kind of the rules of the road in the classroom. We're using valuable time in the classroom, 15 to 20 minutes a week, and we want to make sure that that is a positive experience, which really adds to the education of students. It's not a it's not a recess time. It is a time to expand vocabularies and to introduce children to a wide variety of topics, and to get them excited about reading. And we know that happens. Um, so we feel those orientations are very important. Schools obviously play a huge role in what you do. How do you interact with the schools and make all of this work? Um, you're absolutely right. Schools are very important, and this is a voluntary program. Schools um, are receive, in our participating counties, schools receive an enrollment packet each August, and that is mailed to the principal of each school, and the, the principal chooses whether or not to participate that year. Uh, principals change from year to year, and we want to make sure that the principal is aware of read alouds in their, in their school mm -hmm. and that they are supporting it. We do everything we can to keep it um, as paper-free as we can, but and we pre-print for those schools who have participated in the past so that if the information hasn't changed, they just check a box and sign it and send it back in the pre-addressed envelope. After that, we ask their um, teachers to sign up. Um, who wants a reader? What days or times are most convenient in that particular classroom? And then we go about the task of recruiting and training volunteers to meet those needs. And we particularly find we are challenged to find readers in more rural areas. Um, it's a little easier in urban areas where people can take half hour from their lunch and, and walk over to a school. And there's more people to choose from. Absolutely. Um, but the nice thing is that many of our readers return year after year. So um, as they become accustomed to the process, they're, they're getting back into the classroom early. And our vacancies ideally shrink, and so we have fewer readers to recruit. Mary Kay, stay with us. We'll be right back with more on Libraries Today after this. Welcome to Understood.org, a free online resource for parents of kids with learning and attention issues with personalized recommendations, tools, and expert advice. Welcome back to Libraries Today. We're talking about Read Aloud West Virginia with Executive Director Mary Kay Bond. 
Mary Kay, uh, one of the things that you know, we've talked a lot about what Read Aloud is doing and is trying to accomplish, let's talk about the kids themselves and why is reading aloud so important as opposed to, you know, getting in front of the computer and reading? I mean, what, what's, what's uh, from your perspective, why is it so important? Well, that's a subject near and dear to my heart. Um, I know that we, that we live in a digital world, but the current brain research shows that um, when the human brain reads on a screen, and all of us do that, we are more easily distracted, we do not read as deeply, and we do not retain what we're reading for as long a period of time. Um, given that that is the research, uh, I often say to superintendents and principals, how many of you are looking for a more distracted child or um, children who don't remember what they've read? And um, I've never seen a hand go up, and yet, Sadly, some of our schools are opting for all digital as opposed to a, a print and paper book. A lot of schools don't have libraries at all now. That's exactly right. Um, and even those that do may not have staff to man them. Um, and I think that uh, some research that came out last spring is, is kind of um, indicative of this. They used young children, a pediatrician in the University of Cincinnati, John Hutton, did some research and um, charted the brain waves of children um, who were being read to, they, one of those tube things in the, in the, the hospital, that were being read to um, while they, they were looking at pictures on, and um, um, they charted those brain waves. Then they charted um, the brain waves when the children were listening to a story audio only. And then those who were reading, quote unquote, um, a story video. And what they discovered, and he talk, talk, talks about the Goldilocks effect, the video was too much for these small brains, um, for them to truly process and, and, and for the, the brain to really capture the vocabulary, the essence of the story, that sort of thing. The audio was too little, but having the human voice read the book and turning the pages and being able to observe the pages. That was just right. And, and he points out that it's even more so when you introduce a human being being able to hold the child uh, or sit beside a, a, an older child. Um, and they couldn't mimic that given the, the um, medical equipment they were so using. So he's saying human interaction is the key. Well, yes. And allowing children um, a, a way to process and to, to look. Um, there's a book out now called In the Shallows, and, and it was a, written by a professor who found that his own attention span was diminishing the more he read on a screen. And he thought, well, maybe this is just old age. And he talked to his colleagues, and, and they had similar experiences. So he took a year, and he studied the process. And what they discovered is the more we read on a screen, uh, the more we're kind of um, uh, making our brain a bit lazy. We're not, we're not staying for the, the task at hand. And those three things I mentioned at the outset, we don't read as deeply, we don't remember, we're more easily distracted. Um, I read an article just last night about there's something about the tactile sense of reading a book, there's something about the eye tracking on the page. All of these are important things. Now, if this is true for all of us, it's a particularly important for a developing brain, young children. Um, we hear a lot about abbreviated attention spans, and I think some of that, and I'm not a researcher, but I think some of that could be attributed to some of this research that is coming out. Um, we all know that we're used to being able to push a button and get instant gratification or get that response immediately. Well, life's not like that. Sometimes you have to have a longer attention span and a longer ability to focus, and, and that's, that's part of it. Another aspect was brought to my attention by a principal in the Eastern Panhandle who said, one of the things we've noticed when your readers come to our school is that children, have a, it has a calming effect on the children. We have fewer um, aggressive acts. And I started thinking about that. Um, 
when we're wired, when we're reading on a screen, when we're used to punching or the moving, and the, the, um, there's kind of a uh, uh, hypervigilance. Um, when we're being read to, or when we're reading quietly, I call it mental yoga. There is a slower pace. Um, there's less a sense of being on edge. And um, one of the individuals in the meeting where the principal brought this up said it makes perfect sense. If you're driving a, a vehicle, you're in a vigilant state. You know, what's that car going to do? What, what's the sign up ahead? Who's behind me? That sort of thing. If you're in the front seat passenger's side, you're going, oh, look at that tree. Mm. Oh, my goodness, yes. And the same kind of thing is at play when, you're, when we're reading aloud to a child. There's an enjoyment, an ability to process that is not there when that child is trying to struggle to read on the screen, or, or even for that matter, some, a, a reluctant reader or a, a new reader on the page. And so that's a big function that our readers play. Um, but it saddens me that on the one hand, we argue that children are having abbreviated attention span, and on the other hand, we're introducing them, even in the classroom, to more and more digital, you know, press this button, press that button. You and I talked previously, with the brain research that's currently out there and, and adopting schools, adopting an all digital pose in schools, it seems to me like going to your doctor and then ignoring the advice. <laughs> um, we've paid a lot for this research, and yet we're not implementing it in our schools, and that saddens me. How does West Virginia stack up compared to other states uh, when it comes to reading for children? Um, we're in the 40s, typically. Um, not great. Um, I, I am very proud that since we rebooted West Virginia, our scores have been, have been going up somewhat. Um, we know that it, children are not lab rats, and you can't isolate any one factor. Um, but there does seem to be a strong correlation between the strength of read aloud and the strength of our reading scores. Um, at the 2015 NAEP scores, uh, West Virginia was cited as the state and the nation that made um, the most progress at the eighth grade reading level. And we were really, really pleased with that because if you dialed that back, those kids were just entering the school system when we were rebooting read aloud. Clearly, we're one piece of a puzzle. Um, parents are a huge piece of the puzzle. They have more time with their children. Um, children spend 900 hours in the classroom, 7,800 hours outside the classroom. They have more of an influence. Um, and our children are drawn to those activities that they see their loved ones do. If they see uh, dad follow one particular team or mom in sports, that typically is their team. I'd say WVU students or WVU graduates rarely raise Marshall fans and vice versa. Well, mm -hmm. non reading families rarely raise reading families unless they make an effort to do so. And, and it's really not based on your income. It's based on are you willing to take your child to the library as frequently as you take them to a ball game? Are you willing to turn off the TV some? and sit there at night and read with them as opposed to watching TV? Are you ready to let them see you read a magazine or a newspaper? And I say that because if we read on the screen, our children don't know if we're reading or we're ordering clothing. <laughs> um, and so families are a huge part of it. Schools, high quality reading instruction is a part of it. And I think our volunteers are a part of it. Um, teachers, we survey our teachers and they talk about the interest level of our students when they have a regular reader. The children beg to get more books by a particular author based upon the choices that our reader has made. How best can public libraries support what you're doing? Um, public libraries are essential because they are access. Books are expensive. And um, you know, if you have a limited income, you, you may not be able to, to use it to buy a wide personal library. So we need access and more and more more and more libraries are seeing that. I know in Kanawha County they um, give young children bags of board books that they can take home and um, have for an unlimited period of time. Um, 
that access to having a, a book that I can pick up at any time, that's, that's essential. Um, we have some public librarians who are assisting us at the local chapter level, and we value their involvement. Um, also, libraries play a key role over the summer. Um, we know, based on research, that a lot of children lose ground over the summer, and they return to school with lower reading skills than the skills they had when they left in May or June. Um, the result is that teachers spend four to six weeks remediating a lot of children who have not been read to or have not gone to the library who have, who have not read books. Um, and so you're losing September and part of October in the school year. Um, libraries providing that access, that summer reading program, critical in stemming summer slide. Let me ask you this. If someone wants to volunteer to be a part of Read Aloud West Virginia, how do they go about that? Uh, they can call our office, 304-345-5212. Uh, um, they can visit our website, and um, there is a calendar there of our orientations. They can email us, and that email, I'm hoping you might put on your screen, <laughs> but it's available through the website. Uh, there are any number of ways. Um, those counties that do not have a participating program, if we have some people who are interested in getting it started, they can reach out as well. Um, what we're asking for are volunteers who are willing to give some time to showing children that reading is pleasurable, relevant, and valued. Mary Kay, I appreciate the time and uh, look forward. I know our public libraries look forward to working with you as well. Well, we're very grateful for those libraries, and uh, we do have a great library system, and uh, we hope that a lot of people in West Virginia are taking advantage of it. Thank you, Mary Kay. We'll be back with more on Libraries Today right after this. Every child is curious. George, look what I found. Turn their curiosity into a lifelong love of learning. Create a curious reader. This is super bedtime reading. Share a book together today. Visit read.gov. The U.S. Department of Education says the single most important activity for building the knowledge required for eventual success is reading aloud to children. Read Aloud West Virginia recognizes that and has made it its mission to bring books and reading skills to children all across this state. The WVLC agrees wholeheartedly, and we support state libraries in encouraging readers, young and old, with programs like West Virginia Read Week, Let's Read West Virginia, and our annual summer reading programs. I'd like to thank today's guest, Mary Kay Bond of Read Aloud West Virginia for sharing her vision for improving the most important educational tool in West Virginia schools, reading. I'm Stan Howe. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Libraries Today.